Welcome to Intelligent Faith, where we seek to give you, the listener, intelligent and credible answers to your questions, doubts, and even objections to the Christian faith. My name is Jason Dennett. I'm a teaching pastor at Calvary Chapel of Puerto Rico, and I'm joined by my co-host of Intelligent Faith, Nellis Aberson. As 1 Peter 3.15 commands us, here on Intelligent Faith, we seek to equip Christians to always be ready to give an answer when asked about their belief in Christ and in the God of Scripture. Hey guys, welcome back to Intelligent Faith. Now, Pastor Jason, over the last few episodes, you have given us evidences that points towards God's existence. You said one time is basically like we are detectives and we're walking all over this world, looking at the universe, looking at the evidences, and we analyze the evidences, and that points us towards God's existence. The first one you spoke about was the Kalam argument. If we look at the beginning of the universe, that points towards a creator God. You've looked at the moral argument, how that also points towards God. Now today, what evidences we are going to look at today, Pastor Jason, that points towards God's existence? Well, Noah, today I thought that we would take our listeners to one of the most powerful arguments for God's existence, and this is what we call the fine-tuning of the universe. As you said, Nellis, I really do encourage our listeners to remember that they need to think of themselves kind of like crime scene investigators going through this world, and, and just as Sherlock Holmes would arrive at the scene of a crime, and he would look at certain facts, certain pieces of evidence left on the crime scene, And by examining the known facts, Sherlock Holmes will then come up with the most reasonable explanation of what he knows to be true. That's how Christians should function as we go throughout the world. And as you said, Nellis, we looked at the beginning of the universe. In the Kalam argument, the fact that our universe had a beginning shows us that it also had a cause. We also looked at the moral argument. And the fact that there are objective moral values that exist in our universe point to the fact that there is an objective moral law giver. So we talked about the Kalam argument and the moral argument. And as I said today, I'd like to talk with our listeners about the design argument. Now, I do really think that this could be perhaps one of the most powerful arguments that we have, Nellis, in the arsenal of Christianity. This really is one of the most scientifically based arguments that we have to demonstrate the reality of God's existence, Nellis. And as everybody knows, that science is being so exalted today that many people mistakenly think that science is the only way to obtain truth about reality. And even though that's not the case, uh, we know that philosophy and morality and many other ways can give us truth, we can use science to point as powerfully and persuasively to God's existence. And Nellis, that's where the design argument comes in. And this argument is so strong, it is so effective, that Anthony Flew actually were converted from atheism to belief in God. Now, for our listeners that's not familiar with Anthony Flew, he was one of the most hardcore, fire-breathing atheists from the 1950s. He devoured Christians. He ridiculed Christians for our belief in Christ. And guess what? In 2003, this argument was so powerful for him that he realized that there has to be a designer. Everything could not have just happened by chance. So he converted from atheism to deism. He actually wrote a book. He says there is no God. He scratched down the note with a red marker and wrote A. So it says there is a God. So this argument is really strong. So Pastor Jason, what exactly is the design argument? Nellis, that's a really good example for our listeners to remember. Anthony Flew, one of the strongest atheists from the 1950s, he became a believer in God's existence based upon the design argument. I think specifically it was the design of the DNA molecule and the language encoded in the DNA molecule. This led him to believe that there actually is an intelligent designer behind all biological life. Well, to answer your question, Nellis, what is the design argument? Let me just paint for you kind of a fictional scenario, and I want to ask you how you would respond if this happened. And listeners, you can imagine yourself as well in this fictional scenario. Imagine if you wake up one morning, still groggy from, you know, sleeping, 
sitting in. You had numerous crusties hanging from the corner of your eyes. And you wander into your bathroom just to wash your face and wake up in the morning. And after you splash your face with water about half a dozen times, Nellis, you notice there's something written on your bathroom mirror, something very strange. You discover that smeared with a bar of soap are these disturbing words. I watched you last night while you were sleeping. I'll come back tonight and kill you in your sleep. Nellis, if you woke up, honestly, tomorrow morning, and you discovered those words written in soap on your bathroom mirror, uh, would you simply dismiss them and go on about your day knowing that those words just uh, happened to be there through random chance? Or would you perhaps call the police? How would you act? Well, first of all, I can definitely tell you I will be wide awake at that instantaneous moment without a huge cup of coffee. Second of all, definitely this will not have happened by random chance. My soap bar didn't magically jump up, write these things on the mirror. So using my logic, using my reasoning, I will not fall asleep that night. Yeah, I would react in a very similar way, Nellis. And, you know, it, it sounds kind of like a humorous scenario, but the reason that I would use that picture is to just illustrate to you how naturally we can detect design. And there are many scientists today, Nellis, many even secular non-Christian psychologists that have discovered through research that we have built-in detection for design in the world. And so you just think about a situation like that and all of our listeners would probably respond in the same way. But the question is this, why? Why would we never think that happened by random, accidental, chaotic chance? Now, if you walked into your bathroom, instead of there being uh, two sentences that showed you intelligence, instead of that, if there were just random marks of soap on your mirror, now, not even that would happen by random chance. Even that would arouse curiosity, and even that would arouse suspicion. Because we know from our common experience, and from what we know about reality, that the bar of soap, as you said, could not magically leap up to the mirror and scratch it or rub itself off a numerous places but especially it couldn't do that leaving a pattern that showed intelligence that showed evidence of mind and language through two sentences and so what this shows us Nellis is number one we know automatically it's been built into our brains through innate knowledge that effects have to have a cause in a very basic sense but it also goes to show us that intelligent effects have to have intelligent causes and so this is why when we see uh, intelligent effects out in the world when we see things that scream design uh, letters on a billboard writing in the sand design of a certain type of machine we know from our natural experience that intelligent effects also have to have intelligent causes so definitely information shows an information giver design does show a designer so if we apply it to our lives, why don't we apply it to the natural world that we physically see outside? Now, Pastor Jason, do you have any evidences that you maybe can give us for this argument? As a matter of fact, this entire idea of the design argument, it's actually very, very simple. And we could state it in a very, very simple fashion. Here's one version, Ellis, of the design argument. All true design points to an intelligent designer. Step number two, the universe contains true design... Step number three, therefore, the universe has an intelligent designer. Let me say that again. Step number one, all true design points to an intelligent designer. Number two, the universe contains true design. Step number three, therefore, the universe has an intelligent designer. And Nellis, the interesting thing about the design argument is that it can be applied on numerous different levels. You can apply the design argument to the design that we see in the physics of the universe. You can apply it to the design that we see for our planet. You can apply it to the biology of the human body. You can apply it to the design at the molecular level. And then you can even apply it to the design in the information in the DNA molecules. So don't worry, listeners, we're not going to take you through all of that. But just so you understand, uh, we can do a couple of episodes about this argument alone because there is such an avalanche of scientific evidence backing up design of our universe, 
of biology and of the information in the DNA molecule. Now, listen, this argument is so powerful. There was so much design and fine-tuning that's been discovered in the universe in the 20th century. It's led some of the most widely recognized scientists in different fields of study to talk about this amazing fine-tuning uh, that we do see in the universe. For example, Dr. Paul Davies, in his book About Time, said this, quote, Scientists are slowly waking up to an inconvenient truth. The universe looks suspiciously like a fix. The issue concerns the very laws of nature themselves. For 40 years, physicists and cosmologists have been quietly collecting examples of all too convenient coincidences and special features in the underlying laws of the universe that seem to be necessary in order for life and hence conscious beings to exist. Change any one of them, and the consequences would be lethal. Fred Hoyle, the distinguished cosmologist, once said it was as if, quote, a super intellect has monkeyed with physics. Just like baby bears porridge in the story of Goldilocks, the universe seems to be just right for life. Unquote. That was from Paul Davies in his book About Time. Just really Nellis focusing on the intense design and fine-tuning that we see in the universe. Dr. Michael Denton, uh, he said this in his book Evolution, A Theory in Crisis, commenting on the design at the biological level. He says, quote, To grasp the reality of life, as it has been revealed by molecular biology, we must magnify a cell a thousand million times until it is 20 kilometers in diameter and resembles a giant airship large enough to cover a great city like London or New York. What we would then see would be an object of unparalleled complexity and adaptive design. On the surface of the cell, we would see millions of openings, like the portholes of a vast spaceship, opening and closing to allow a continual stream of materials to flow in and out. If we were to enter one of these openings, we would find ourselves in a world of supreme technology and bewildering complexity. He goes on to say, the complexity of the simplest known type of cell is so great that it is impossible to accept that such an object could have been thrown together suddenly by some kind of freakish, vastly improbable event. Such occurrence would be indistinguishable from a miracle. And so, Nellis, again, I could just read through quote after quote of scientists and modern thinkers who are commenting about the incredible design and fine-tuning we find in our universe, either at the cosmic level or at the biological level. These quotes are just so powerful. Even Bill Gates, in his book, The Road Ahead, said this, quote, DNA is like a computer program, but far, far more advanced than any software ever created, unquote. And so these quotes just go a long way to really lend support that modern thinkers all over the world are throwing their support behind the design argument. Charles Darwin himself even said this, Nellis, in his book Origin of the Species, quote, if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed, which could not possibly have been formed by numerous successive slight modifications, my theory would absolutely break down. What an amazing quote by Charles Darwin in his book Origin of the Species, that if it could be demonstrated that any complex organ existed that couldn't have been formed by small changes over time, his theory would absolutely break down. And lastly, Nellis, there is a website called descentfromdarwin.org. Over 750 PhD scientists from all over the world have signed their names to this statement. Listen to this, quote, We are skeptical of the claims of the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. Careful examination of the evidence for the Darwinian theory should be encouraged. What an amazing statement that over 750 PhD scientists from all over the world have signed their names to at descentfromdarwin.org. Really just throwing their academic credibility behind the design argument. And for our listeners in Psalm 19 verse 1, when David says, The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament shows his handiwork. Now this probably speaks about the design argument, how God has designed everything. Is that correct, Pastor Jay? Yeah, I would say so, Nellis. I think there's numerous reasons why the Lord inspired David to write that, but certainly I think that there is design and magnificence and elegance as we look at the created heavens all around us. So again, listeners, the design argument 
Step number one, all true design points to an intelligent designer. Uh, that seems to be pretty logical. Our common experience shows us that, that all true design does point to an intelligent designer. But step number two is really the controversial idea. The universe contains true design. That really is the issue in the stake of this argument. So let me just examine three different areas where we know that there is fine-tuning and just incredible precision within the universe. As most of you, our listeners, would know, there's numerous forces at work in the natural world. One of the ways in which the design argument is so powerful is as we look at the laws of physics. Now, within the laws of physics, there are certain constants. What a constant is, is when a force of nature is assigned a mathematical value, that mathematical value never changes. It is constant. And as a matter of fact, it has to be constant in order for complex life to exist in the world. And so, listeners, one of the best ways the design argument comes into play is by examining how many constants of nature are there and what is their level of fine-tuning and precision. So, Nellis, let me just go over three of these constants in the time that we have left, and it definitely proves the point that the universe contains true design and fine-tuning. Design evidence number one is the fine-tuning of the gravitational force. Now, most of our listeners, Nellis, probably take the force of gravity for granted. But actually, the gravitational force, as it's technically called, is one of the four fundamental forces in our universe. It pervades the entire universe, and along with three other forces, it's one of the most important forces for life in our universe. But listeners, did you know that if this force was altered by just a hair's breadth, any complex life in our universe, including humans, would be physically impossible? Listen to this. If the gravitational force was changed by just one part in 10 followed by 40 zeros, the results would be catastrophic for biological life. So listen to the fine-tuning of the gravitational force. If the force of gravity was changed by one chance in 10,000 billion, 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 life would not be possible. The sun wouldn't exist, the moon would drift off into space or possibly collide with the earth itself. Human, complex biological life wouldn't even be possible. If you change the force of gravity by one part in 10 followed by 40 zeros, life would not be possible. That is a razor-sharp fine-tuning of the force of gravity. But number two, there is also a fine-tuning of the universe's expansion speed. The expansion of the universe was discovered by Edwin Hubble in 1929. And so our universe is expanding at a certain speed, but this speed is a constant. It cannot change. It's called the cosmological constant, Nellis. And if the cosmological constant varies at all, complex biological life couldn't happen. But how precisely fine-tuned is the cosmological constant? Well, according to modern cosmologist Nellis, the expansion speed of the universe is finely tuned to one part in 10 with 53 zeros behind it. That is a gigantic number, listeners. The speed of the expansion of the universe has to be precisely balanced where it is, one part in 10 with 53 zeros behind it. What kind of a number is that? One chance in 100 million, billion, 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 billion. What an incredible level of fine-tuning and precision that we see, not only in the force of gravity, but in the universe's expansion. Now, Jason, these numbers that you give us is actually really extremely ridiculously high numbers. Now, did these numbers, somebody just thought of these numbers, or do they actually have mathematical proof of these numbers? They actually have mathematical calculations for the fine-tuning of these numbers. A good resource for our listeners to research would be Robin Collins. He's a cosmologist that specializes in these fine-tuning probabilities, and they could look up Robin Collins, and these numbers are actually reflected there. So again, the fine-tuning of the force of gravity, the fine-tuning of the expansion of the universe, and lastly, Nellis, the fine-tuning of what we call the strong nuclear force. Now again, this force is taken for granted by our listeners more than likely. Atoms hold together because the strong nuclear force holds them together in the nucleus of the atom. The protons and neutrons in the nucleus of every atom are held together by this incredibly strong force called the strong nuclear force. Now we know that it has to be incredibly powerful because Nellis, what happens uh, when an atom is split? 
Well, if it's a plutonium or a uranium atom, we of course know that there is an atomic explosion. And so the strong nuclear force is absolutely incredible, and it's one of the four fundamental forces that allows life to be possible, complex biological life in our universe. But physicists and cosmologists have also been shocked to discover that the strength of the strong nuclear force is also finely tuned upon a razor's edge. How finely tuned is it? Well, if the strength of the strong nuclear force were to decrease by just one part in 10,000 billion, 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 then no atoms would hold together, elements would never form, and complex life would be scientifically impossible. Now, unless that is one chance out of one followed by 31 zeros behind it. So, Nellis, this is just fine-tuning uh, in a breathtaking degree. The fine-tuning of the strong nuclear force, the universe's expansion, and the force of gravity. And listeners, you have to understand, it's not just that each one of these has to be finely tuned to an incomprehensible degree. They have to be fine-tuned in their ratio to one another. And it's not just three factors that have to be finely tuned. There are anywhere from 30 to 55 constants of nature that have to be finely tuned for the existence of complex biological life. Uh, a couple others uh, would be the speed of light, the fine tuning of the cosmic background radiation, the mass density term, the space energy density, the mass of the proton, mass of the electron. So many different factors, Nellis, have to be finely tuned upon a razor's edge for complex biological life to be a reality. So, is it true that the universe contains true design and fine tuning? Absolutely. But if step number one is true, all true design points to an intelligent designer, and step number two, the universe contains true design, then step number three follows. Therefore, the universe has an intelligent designer. And so, Nellis, this design argument, especially when examining the constants of the universe, is incredibly powerful. Now listen, this is a scientific argument that has theological implications. And what I mean by that is this is just raw, solid scientific information and research. But when you put the scientific information together, it points in the direction of God's existence. And so I do encourage our listeners to commit the design argument to their memory. All true design points to an intelligent designer. The universe contains true design. Therefore, the universe has an intelligent designer. Maybe that's why the Lord asked Job in chapter 38, verse 33. He says, Job, do you know the laws of the universe? Can you use them to regulate the earth? These laws of the universe and their fine-tuning definitely point to the existence of the intelligent designer. And this intelligent designer is described for us in the book of Colossians, chapter 1, verse 15. It says, Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme over all creation. For through him God created everything in the heavenly realms and on earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we can't see, such as thrones, kingdoms, rulers, and authorities in the unseen world. Everything was created through him and for him. And listeners, that includes you. The intelligent designer, the Lord God himself, designed you with a purpose and a plan. He has made you for himself. I encourage you to draw close to him, to Jesus Christ, the designer, even today. Well, that's all the time we have for today's program. Thanks for joining us again at Intelligent Faith, where we seek to give you logical and biblical answers to your questions, doubts, and even objections to the Christian faith. If you'd like to come join us for our Intelligent Faith Discipleship class, come to Calvary Chapel of Puerto Rico every Thursday evening at 7.30 p.m. and we'd love to have you in our Intelligent Faith Discipleship class. Feel free to give us a call at 787-720-3308. Again, that's 787-720-3308 and we'd love to have you in our class. Intelligent Faith is a teaching ministry of Calvary Chapel of Puerto Rico. We'd love to have you come by and visit us. We're located in the Los Jardines Shopping Center in Guaynabo. We have our services on Sunday morning at 9.30 and 11.30. We'd love to have you come join us for fellowship. 
Don't forget to check out our website, intelligentfaith315.com, where you can find hundreds of articles, videos, and resources to further equip yourself how to defend and to express the Christian worldview with grace and with intelligence. We look forward to having you back next time on Intelligent Faith. Until then, God bless you.